Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to all of you from wherever you join this life science supply chain management webinar. Um, as we are a Swiss company, of course, we start on time. Um, so my name is Patrick Wall from Tenfpin Management Consultants, and I'm happy to be your host for today's uh, webinar. Today we'll talk about how supply chain management as an enterprise function ensures business continuity during and post the corona crisis. As I said, this webinar is hosted by Tenfpin Management Consultants and supported by Gartner and the University of Applied Sciences Bonn-Rhein-Sieg. Before we start with the actual webinar, let me explain some administrative things. Um, so first of all, the session will be, of course, recorded and uh, you will get, of course, a download of the, the recording plus also the presented slides afterwards. Um, as you all know or recognize, you're all on mute, um, but there's, of course, the opportunity for all of you to hand in and raise questions. So there's a questions function and incorporated in the GOAT webinar tool. So feel free to raise your questions. We collect all those questions and uh, those questions will be answers at the end of this session. Or if we don't have enough time, we will send you the uh, answers after the, the session via email. So let me first of all show you who we are, uh, who your three speakers of today's webinar are. And I'll start with um, Frank in the middle. So Frank, um, I'm very happy and honored to have um, you on board for this webinar and that you from from uh, Gartner are supporting this webinar. So Frank is from uh, the Gartner Analyst Group. Frank is a VP responsible for service delivery. Um, before his career at uh, Gartner, he was uh, VP supply chain management um, for Johnson Controls. And you can see that he is an awarded supply chain professional and speaker. And Plus, we have Professor Dr. Robert Grüter. He's a professor at the University of Applied Sciences, Bonn-Rhein-Sieg, long term. His area of expertise um, and research are supply chain finance in particular and supply chain simulations. And supply chain simulations, we'll go into more detail later on in the last part, part of, this, um, of this session. And last but not least, um myself so i'm patrick patrick wolf um global lead partner for supply chain management and tap in management consultants i have a background of 20 years in management consulting um, particular in the area of supply chain management so i led large size transformation projects and my area of expertise when it comes to industries is life sciences in particular so that's why we uh, focus today um, on the life science industry. So those are the three speakers, and I'm very thrilled to be your host for today's um, webinar. So before we start with the content part, let me quickly do some advertising, of course I have to. Um, so let me give you some insights on your today's host of the webinar. So Tenth Pin Management Consultants um, is a Swiss-based um, consultancy focusing 100% on life science industry. And there we provide end-to-end -end consulting services. So from management consulting to IT consulting out of one hand, end-to-end. -end. And um, so we combine deep dive industry knowledge with a lot of process management consulting um, expertise. And also by applying latest technologies which are out there. And you see the our global footprint. Um, and this gives you an overview, as I said, um, of the overall consulting services we at, at Tenfin provide. So starting from business consulting, um, a, a lot of in, in the area of innovation management. We also do a lot of advisory services in the area of mergers and acquisitions. And as I said, there's a, also a strong background in technology consulting in particular when it comes to SAP technologies. So that was the advertising part of this webinar. Um, 
So let me come to the agenda. So we started with the introduction of our today's speakers. Then um, Frank from Gartner will give you an, an overview of the uh, current impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on particular life science industry and share some latest um, insights and studies from Gartner. Then myself um, will take over and uh, tell you something about what has the black swan to do with the supply chain resilience um, to explain some, some terms in that, in that context. And we'll continue with um, the role of supply chain management as we see it to ensure business continuity during the crisis we are currently in and also hopefully post COVID-19 crisis. And then I'll hand over to Professor Dr. Robert Grüter who will give you uh, very much details on how to stress test your supply chain capabilities. Again, as part of the current crisis we're in and, and also post crisis um, with the help of supply chain simulations. And then we have um, some spare time for Q&A at the end of this webinar. Okay, so I'll hand over to the first part of our webinar to Frank. Um, so Frank from Gartner will share some latest insights and studies um, coming from Gartner analysts, um, reflecting the impacts of COVID-19 crisis on business in general, but also of course, focusing on, on life science industry. Frank? The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and good um, morning and to good afternoon and good evening. I think we have a couple of people from Europe, US, and also some people from Asia today on the call. So I'm um, being asked to give you a little bit of, of our perspective on, on COVID-19, but looking into um, a couple of areas really from uh, managing the risk, but also going into response and then also having a view on what leading uh, companies would be doing and what leading within the new realities as we would call it at, at Gardner would, would look like. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Now, when, when we started really looking into COVID-19, um, we have been covering COVID-19 from a Ghana perspective quite early, and you may have seen some of our research and uh, some of our Gardner COVID-19 resource centers already, and you may make make use of it. But really, when we're looking at that, uh, we, we started in, in that of, of seeing different waves and, and one of the first waves obviously is a pandemic crisis we all have to get used to and, and coping with it uh, currently but also we're looking into the implications on, on the economy from a macro level point of view and really looking into the different segments and, and industries going into where is it turning into and is it turning into a financial crisis but more importantly um, it's what what are the learnings and what kind of advice can we give um, to companies uh, how we can work and lead within the new reality so we we're coming up and we with a couple of series of um, we call it special interest groups and action groups um, at, at Ghana started with uh, COVID-19 calling them from risk to recovery uh, currently we have a lot of areas being covered in in working within the new realities which means guiding our members to get used to that, but also then looking into leading within the new realities. So today is all about giving you some kind of uh, flavor of that, what that could look like. Um, also referring into some kind of forward looking uh, related to the life science industry. So moving on to, to the next slide. Now, when we and started on on really looking into the impact we we looked into certain topics first and foremost uh, most important is the impact on on people what does it mean uh, for people um, being um, working through the current crisis but also uh, the implications going forward but also what does it mean in terms of governance and communication models uh, companies need to have towards their, their own people, their own employees, but also their partners in the extended end-to-end uh, -end supply chain. Uh, 
financial implications looking into um, from risk to recovery, but then also really going uh, into the demand side and also supply side on things. What we're seeing um, is already a shift from really demand-driven supply chains into more um, constrained supply-driven uh, supply chains. So that's something you may have noticed as well because um, a big learning is um, as an outcome of, of these, these uh, COVID-19 crisis is the understanding and the transparency of your full end-to-end -end supply chain network, um, upstream and downstream, really having everything mapped, but also having the ability and transparency and visibility with real-time data and having an understanding on the impact uh, on your business at any given point point of time. So moving on to, to the next slide, it's really it's a bit of a prediction when we asked uh, companies, and that's coming from our uh, colleagues from Ghana for finance leaders, where they asked uh, um, some of their members um, and their chief financial officers, and where they took a prediction on, uh, you know, where do they see the revenue going, and is it going to be impacted positively, negatively, and and all that. And we all know. There's a couple of scenarios out there from a U and from an L, from a V and, and W shape. Now, our view is that, that we're going to have um, a combination of everything, which means when you look at uh, the overall market from a GDP point of view, we probably going to see some um, contraction going on. Um, but also, we're going to see that certain industries are more impacted than, than others. Um, and also that we're going to see certain industries coming out um, with a recovery uh, at different stages. Um, now, what we don't know is that when we would enter a second wave of a pandemic, which we hopefully not, what implication that it's going to have uh, down, down the line. So now moving on to the next slide, we, we also obviously looked into more details and uh, the one thing i really want to point out here is when we asked um cfos um in you know fortune 500 companies uh, 46 percent of them actually uh, predicting um a revenue decline between somewhere in the area of 10 to 30 percent now it, it could mean for for some of uh, the um, industries uh, at a lower scale, for for some of them on on a higher scale. If you think about a uh, different type of industries, like the automotive industry is in a different uh, way impacted, like the life science industries, where perhaps in the automotive industry you would see it more on a higher scale of even above 20, 25 percent revenue decline. Now. That means that companies are currently modeling a lot of the business impact and also looking into how can we mitigate our risk, how can we manage our risk, and how can we manage our supply chains uh, going, going forward. Moving on to the next slide, please. Now, it doesn't surprise anybody, I think, on this, on this call today that um, now cash um, and the cash position of yourself, but not only yourself, but also of your extended supply chain network. If you're looking into your suppliers and the suppliers of your suppliers, uh, but also when you're looking into the credit risk, you're going to have with customers or perhaps potentially with sales channels that that is one of the biggest uh, you know, focus areas for companies uh, currently. Supply chains obviously focusing on, on, on risk modeling, um, but also risk management actively in the, in the task force. Often what we see is as well that companies having joint task force with suppliers um, being part of it, perhaps even um, logistic service providers being part of it because uh, capacity in the market um, of transportation and logistics is also a bottleneck and also looking into the credit risk, or uh, liquidity risk they have in a, in a whole end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain. Moving on to the uh, next slide, please. Now, that sums it up a little bit where the majority of the industries are sitting. I'm not saying life science always is being there and you, you would see the same in your 
uh, environment, but typically we're coming right from a cycle of, of growth. Uh, we're managing through a crisis right now. The majority of all industries are, are sitting in managing cost cash uh, currently with a couple of, of things. They're focusing on, on the cost side in, in a way of managing, but optimizing um, or reducing, looking into actions they need to take in, in a way of adjusting their structures from an SGNA point of view. Um, being very disciplined in their spending habits, um, reviewing their um, capex uh, spending or their investments under uh, the microscope and really looking into really segmenting them, prioritizing them, um, but most importantly also reviewing their, their strategy um, and if their strategy is still valid or if they have to adjust uh, certain things. Now moving on to the next slide. Now a couple of things we we obviously seeing from a demand risk and and recovery point of view. What companies currently focusing on, and some of them, I've mentioned. I've mentioned about that having transparency and visibility in your end-to-end um, -end supply chain or supply chains because you may have uh, many of them and having an understanding of your current inventory uh, situation and supply situation at any given point of time. Um, remember I mentioned also that we're moving more from a demand-driven supply chain to a supply-constrained supply chain, which means focuses also the ability of your supplier and if he can or cannot uh, deliver um, material to you um, or even finished products. Um, tracking daily run rates. Some of um, our companies we're talking to, they're really focusing also on prioritization of, of different product groups and really uh, focusing on, on them. Um, having sales and operation uh, planning uh, on SNOP as a main main business uh, management process currently, but we're also hoping that's consistent going forward and that it's being made sustainable. Um, obviously, currently the focus is more on the shorter time horizon, which you would also call SNOE. Um, and then also con continuously reviewing the risk because we, we also know that we're living in a very dynamic world, which means things may change, not only monthly, weekly, daily, sometimes even hourly. So having that somewhere being built in into your demand side and you, you cannot decouple demand from, from the supply side anymore is something which needs to be taken into consideration. So moving on to the next slide, um, we, we obviously have the same kind of um, supply risk. And when you think about your supply, we need to also work in scenarios. And most importantly here, what we advising our um, clients on is, is really looking into the full end-to-end -end supply chain and really understanding the, the mapping of your supply chain upstream and downstream, the suppliers of your suppliers, because you may have small but very, very critical suppliers which run into trouble. And it might be financially from their cash position point of view to, to keep their operations up, up and running, it, it might be because of um, you know, certain um, absentees um, and uh, shortage of, of labor. But things like that are very, very dynamic and they need to be looked at um, in, in a joint effort between all the parties in, in a supply uh, chain. Uh, hands and building an understanding of risk, but also building an understanding of opportunities. Because when you look at, when you're coming out of a wave and you're going from a risk into a recovery, you also want to use that as potentially as an opportunity um, for for your business, but also for the business of, of your, your partners. Um, and having that visibility and business continuity planning being built in not only now when we manage the crisis uh, and also be going to recovery, but also as an ongoing effort um, and the learning we all gonna take as an outcome of, of COVID-19. So moving on to the next slide, um, I looked into now what are some of the things which are now becoming a little bit more relevant for the life science industry and some of the things 
we may see. Um, now, regulations are probably going to change. Think about that from a point of view that governments maybe want to take more control over critical supply of uh, certain, uh, you know, medications. Um, and that that has uh, imp implications. You may also want to see it uh, from uh, a point point of view that uh, you, you you have to provide more information, which means your your patients um, they want to have more information, more information about what are you doing as a company, but also more information about your product. So it's a new uh, trend evolving uh, also from that uh, point of view. Uh, that you, you have to think about the communication towards your patient going forward as being um, the one who's gonna and wanna be more informed um, and wanna be almost being part of a decision-making going forward when you think about where you're gonna uh, provide your products going forward to. Um, one of the things we're seeing evolving is we call it global supply chain. Uh, so, um, it's a mix between a global and a local supply chain, which means um, certain of the supply chains which are today offshore, as we would call them, we will see them onshore, uh, which means supply chain will be uh, coming potentially shorter, and hence we, we're calling them local supply chains. We know that a company is currently going through business model um, scenario planning um, as a first result of COVID-19 and looking into the impact from a financial point of view, but as a outcome of that, at some point of time, not so far off, they will also look into how is my supply chain being set up from the overall network? And is there anything what I have to, to change from, you think, your raw material supply to your manufacturing um, to maybe also looking into now when we want to go into more personalization of uh, drugs going forward, um, do we need such kind of long supply chains in, in future? Now, we are also seeing a, a big trend in a, in a way of digital insights in intelligent ecosystems. And, and we call it more like the smart connected ecosystem, which you would see on the left side of, of the slides, where uh, we're not going to talk just as a company, and companies don't compete against companies, and future they compete against ecosystem. And and if you look at that, it's a whole healthcare system, uh, and you being part of a healthcare system, and um, hence we we seeing the rise and the acceleration of uh, digital insights and intelligence ecosystems coming coming up. Um, and that goes obviously with the personal effective medical treatment and um, the changes which are coming as an outcome of, of that. So I believe I'm almost done moving on to my last slide. And I want to leave you with that. And on the one side, I believe we, we're managing a lot of risk. We see all the risk on the left side. On the other side, we we having opportunities. If we seeing the opportunities now, and from Gardner, we we often talk about you need to be able to sense, you need to sense the changes are coming, um, but you need to be able to respond at any given point of time in a very highly complex world, uh, very dynamically driven, and you have to be able to do to other things you have to be able to perform. That's you know your day-to-day -day business where you run your operations and where you generate sustainable business performance and results. And that gives you the ability to transform and build you know higher, better capabilities in order to compete in future in a whole entire new world, which we would call a digital ecosystem. So thank you very much, Patrick. Um, that was my part, and back to you. Thank you very much, Frank, for this very comprehensive overview of the current situation assessed by Gartner. I very much liked also the, the way you explained the role of SNOP, but I'll come back to this topic um, later on in my last part. So could you, operator, oh, I can do as well. 
so let's continue. Um, so I will continue with the topic of supply chain resilience. I guess most of you have already seen many articles and um, and also presentation and webinars like this um, the last weeks. Um, before coming to supply chain resilience, let's talk quickly about the, the black swan. Um, I think most of you would, would um, agree that uh, this specific and, and, and very particular event and crisis we are all in can be categorized as a black swan. Maybe Bill Gates will not agree as he uh, forecasted and, and, and has seen this event many years ago, but um, I think most of you would agree that this COVID-19 crisis is really an extraordinary um, event. So this event is very rare. It has a severe impact, I, can, uh, I guess all of you will confirm, and, um, but how to cope with it? So on the one side, um, it's very crucial to develop ability and capabilities to build in robustness against those negative events to prevent um, severity um, in the case of the next crisis like this, like a black swan. Um, uh, to emphasize, of course, yeah, very crucial it is um, to build in this robustness against um, those kind of tremendous negative events. So let me ask you two questions you cannot answer because you're on mute, but um, um, two answers, uh, sorry, two questions I have. First one is, do you think your supply chain organization within your enterprises are well prepared or were well prepared for the COVID-19 crisis. And the second one is, would you say that your supply chains are robust and resilient enough to cope with the, all the disruptions we learned from, 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 from Frank um, coming from the COVID-19 crisis? I guess most of you would um, answer those two questions with no. So let me share some additional figures um, beyond the, the Gartner figures we've already seen from Frank. So many companies, two thirds of the companies report that out of US that they are somehow impacted and disrupted within their supply chains. Another one um, from a different source that uh, minimum five million companies are indirectly impacted because one or more tier two suppliers out of the, the most impacted uh, region in China who buy um, deliver or source material from from that region so that's why a lot of and you see the numbers five million companies are somehow impacted and coming more to a life science um, study just recently um, published by professor dr frankas uh, so thanks to him so there i took one um, graph um, a very nice one and, and important one you see the the percentage of api products which are produced in, in two main countries, uh, in India and China, and, um, and shipped to Europe and US where the bulk and then packaging operations takes place. So a large dependency. But there will be a different webinar very soon on that specific topic. So that's why we see as 10th pin, um, we have to build in more resilience and robustness in, in uh, company supply chains. But how to do this? That's where resilient supply chain on, and resi um, supply chain resilience come in, comes into play. I guess most of you have heard of that term. It's used uh, very often nowadays. It consists of two main elements. On the one side, um, the ability of supply chains to absorb and dampen the impact of the actual disruption without any um, breaking and, and failing of the system. And on the other side, of course, also to recover from that crisis. So that's the ability of a supply chain to recover, to recover um, operationally and also financially after the big uh, disruption, and maybe also come back stronger and smarter than before. That's why I want to go into more detail about um, measures we see, and, and I had a lot of uh, conversations the last three weeks with many life science companies how they survive, so that's more the short-term short, short -term view. And on top of that, yeah, how they have foreseen and, and, and already taken measures to, to recover from that crisis. And that will be the, the part now I'm going into more detail. So how supply chain as a function ensures business continuity during, 
So that's how to survive the crisis and also post crisis. So let me just pick some um, key measures we see um, which are important from our point of view to survive the crisis. So I'll start with um, one very important one, and I think it was also mentioned by, by Frank, it's the inventory management. So there we see you have to assess the overall coverage of your, your, your buffer inventories throughout your chain, not only on the, on the finished goods side, but, but also on your, your API side and also on, on bulk operations. So that's very crucial, and not only within your boundaries, within your company, but also beyond. So assess the, the, the inventory, which is held um, on the one side, on, on your customer side, on wholesaler side, for instance, and also on the supplier side. And also a lot of a very important role plays um, the allocation process and set clear priorities um, within the, most of the cases nowadays, daily allocation process for those products which are uh, under allocation. And the second one was already, I think, mentioned by Frank is supplier monitoring. This plays a very important role. You've seen the, the figures, the, the high dependency of, of uh, life science companies on API products sourced from, from India and China. So this has to be closely monitored, those critical materials. But funny enough, it's not always API, which can be a shortage. Um, I talked to another um, pharma company two weeks ago. So there they were suffering from supply shortages um, on bottles and, and caps. So not on API side. So monitor the overall um, sourcing portfolio and, and your strategic suppliers. And this can change over time. Let's come. So in this phase, we put a lot of, and, and you all of, all of you, I uh, guess, put a lot of effort in ensuring the business continuity nowadays over the last weeks by focusing on, on you know, securing supply on the one side, be flexible and agile in inventory uh, management and placement throughout your chain. And of course, and that was also emphasized by Frank, protecting overall cash flow. That's key in the current situation we're still in. Secondly, um, what is also very important, and um, that was also mentioned by Frank again, the business continuity plan. So I guess all of you, you have business continuity plans in, in place, um, most probably last times updated during the um, earthquake in, in Japan, most probably, or the financial crisis. Um, so there are plans there, but um, what is very important is in particular after the crisis, when, you're, when we are in the recover um, phase, to also enhance existing business um, continuity plans by all the lessons learned we are, we are now learning. That's very important. Um, and secondly, what I've also um, discussed with many pharma companies, the way um, to build in flexibility in your production facilities and production lines, which of course in the regulated environment is quite a, a complex exercise, not that easy. But um, so, for instance, the, the assignment of, of a number of operators and, and skills within your production facilities, this has to be reviewed basically on a, on a daily basis um, in current days to be flexible enough to adjust. So, for instance, if there are um, yeah, operators which, which fell ill, um, so how to replace them and then restructure and assign your, your, your operators to machines. So that's very important and also for future to be more flexible in your manufacturing assets. And also things like uh, already mentioned, um, the, to build up additional capabilities, again, onshoring of, of uh, production facilities as one example. So this phase already starts with some preparation of uh, hopefully the soon coming recover stage um, by sustaining most of the measures um, your organization have already taken the last uh, couple of weeks. Let's come to the more medium term uh, view um, within the supply chain resilience. So that's more of the, the phase of um, the recover phase, which, as I said, will come hopefully very soon for us all. Um, some key measures we, we see and um, which are very relevant for this phase to be well re um, prepared for the return. Um, definitely one is, all of you, I guess all of you, will have currently task forces all over the place in your companies. 
to survive the COVID crisis. This will should remain still for the recover phase as well, because there it's quite important to simulate recover plans, which uh, maybe you have already in place or you're, you're currently developing. And Professor Grüter will come back to, um, to this um, importance of supply chain simulations in the recover phase very soon. Um, and as I said, it's also very relevant and important to collect all the different measures and learnings from the crisis um, to build it in, in uh, the next uh, release of the business continuity plans. Backup sourcing, I will not go into more detail, it was also mentioned by Frank, but there will be also a separate webinar very soon um, where we dig into more detail about backup sourcing, in particular of, of API products. Let me come lastly to a um, very important thing um, about digital supply chain ecosystem, I called it. So that's the way to sustain partnerships. I think that what we also see the last weeks during the crisis is there's a lot of commitment from various um, parties involved in, in, in this crisis management to, to cooperate and, and, and uh, throughout different uh, companies so different business partners are heavily involved in that, including also governmental authorities. That's very relevant to survive. And um, to sustain this, there should be a thing like we call a digital supply chain ecosystem. So there also very important is to revisit your digital supply chain transformation roadmap if it's already in place and prioritize preferable initiatives supporting supply chain resilience. Do those initiatives first. And also what is also a learning um, we should in, incorporate in that phase is to assess where different workarounds you, you build um, can be digitized by, by using uh, different uh, digital solutions like AI. I have a nice example of a, of a pharma company. They produce COVID-19 test kits. So as you could imagine, they are very much under pressure and um, demand volumes are uh, boosting like hell. So in their crisis situation, they have a big um, challenge to forecast the demand for even the next days because it very much depends uh, demand on on um, on test kits of the testing strategy per country, and that's very hard to predict. So there they build some some workarounds how to incorporate um, cases which are reported by each and every country and how to derive from there, from those figures, their future demand on test kits. So those kind of things should be assessed and, and, um, and evaluated how they can be digitized by using um, smart solutions like AI machine learning technologies. So get prepared for the new normal um, and build in sustainable digital supply chain resilience. So that will be the next phase um, in the recover phase. Let me come to um, two more slides. And um, I think that's also very important to emphasize this again. And I can report this from various um, conversations I had with many um, pharma companies the last weeks. Um, and that's the process of sales and operation planning. Um, I assume many of you have a sales and operation planning process in place somehow. And um, so it's not new. You see the, the, the characteristics of a traditional, of a normal SNOP process on the left-hand side. I don't want to do a lecture on SNOP, um, but I see that um, the sales and operation planning process in the current crisis mode is very relevant and important. And there's also some, some different um, characteristics I see nowadays um, of SNOPs in the current um, situations um, many companies are facing. So many companies have moved from a traditional monthly SNOP process to weekly or most of the cases daily SNOP um, meetings. Um, many companies um, nowadays prepare also short-term scenarios, best worst case, worst worst case scenarios, um, to distinguish between um, different assumptions you have coming from the demand or the supply side and to build this in short-term scenarios. And the key priority we also talked about is, um, apart from the supply chain issues to solve, is of course to optimize the overall cash flow position of the company. 
And in the next phase, in the recover phase, um, I also see a very important role um, the overall SNOP process um, plays in many, or basically in all companies, um, to manage the recover mode. So I guess I assume in a few weeks, hopefully, many companies can switch from a daily, hopefully, to a weekly SNOP process again. <clears throat> and um, very important as part of the SNOP process is to define ramp up, or many, in some cases also ramp down um, plans for, for companies um, based on different assumptions to play. And there again, supply chain simulation plays a, a very important role. Um, it's also key to develop um, continuous scenario assessments, ad hoc, um, what if scenarios and what if comparisons and considering the trade-off um, in many cases um, by basing them on, on financial implications as well to decide which scenario is the, the preferred one. And then also revisit your allocation rules. So for instance, what is the dependency on the sequence and magnitude of, of ramping up your manufacturing sites again. So to sum up, um, I see sales and operation planning, um, which is not new. It exists as a process for uh, nearly four decades. But I see this as a key enabler and, and platform because all um, enterprise functions are involved anyhow in this SNOP process. And that's why I see sales and operation planning as a process very relevant in the current situation and also beyond in the recover mode. That's why I mentioned several times um, supply chain simulations as a very important part um, of an SNOP process. So that's why I think it's a perfect handover to you, Robert. So the stage is yours. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I love to hear supply chain simulation that often. It's perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, now it should work. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you, Patrick, for, for the invitation. And uh, also thank you uh, both to you for some really nice insights. Before we start, uh, let me say a few words about me and my research. So just checking whether you can see my screen. But I think it works. So, okay, perfect. So, um, as Patrick already told you, uh, I used to be a full time consultant where I developed and applied a supply chain simulation framework with uh, dozens of clients in order to optimize their supply chains. And uh, this is um, now also a field that keeps me busy as a professor besides uh, supply chain finance, um, and which may become even more important in the unfolding economic crisis. And um, yes, my employer, uh, the University of Applied Sciences bonn rhein sieg known for its research on robotics and Industry 4.0, uh, lets me do all this fun stuff. Uh, and there I also teach in the supply chain management major. So today, I like to give you a quick overview why you should care about supply chain risk management and uh, demonstrate to you in a live demo why simulation is a great tool to realize supply chain risk management. So the starting point is uh, usually uh, the well-known impact probability matrix in order to collect and quantify risk via impact and probability. So once you have mapped your risk into the matrix, you can use that to start the playbook of scenarios. Second, borrowing from Finance 101, we can transfer the classic risk return curve to our supply chain risk management topic. It is important to first know where you are on your current risk return curve and whether it is the right strategic position for you. So for example, you could manage a few risks, 
and move more to the left like this and you end up here thereby decreasing your risk but also decreasing your return and second since there are not perfect markets in supply chain risk management you can grab a bargain with some advanced risk management techniques such as supply chain finance or network design and increase your efficiency thereby both lowering risk and increasing return for example moving up to this spot here but how can you do this you do it by managing your risk exposure controlling how, how vulnerable your supply chain is to a specific risk you can basically choose between four options so i've included some pictures with reference to the current crisis and first you could just take the risk and accept full exposure not a good idea probably second you could share the risk often with an insurance company or within your supply chain with your supply chain partners however this comes at a certain cost and even more if you try to reduce the risk for example with the second source in the supply context and finally you could just stay at home and completely avoid the risk which however is rarely feasible in a supply chain setting because eventually this means exiting the market so what i often observe that companies use software and tools with deterministic and rather simplistic frameworks such as most erp systems but that's planning for the happy path and you see on the left yeah, this really looks nice but it's rather unrealistic because in fact and this is something we all bitterly know now it's not very wise and in fact we face complex interdependent and stochastic systems and the path you're facing looks more like this you see here on the right and guess what supply chain simulation is exactly the method that you should consider when facing those three properties randomness interdependentness and complexity simulation shines with the ability to model a system as it is so not working with averages but working with real order data real supply chain data and capturing all relevant details and <clears throat> giving you exact analysis as announced uh, i will also show you how this can be done and i uh, will now show you a live demo of a corona inspired model in the simulation software any logistics So you should now see the software screen, and uh, this is any logistics. It's a 2015 spin-off of the renowned simulation software AnyLogic, and it's specialized to optimize and simulate supply chains. So in contrast to other simulation software I use, it's really user-friendly and quickly generates results. The supply chain I built for this webinar, for example, can be set up in not more than 15 minutes of course if you know what you are doing so here we have a view of europe and asia and we start with our supplier here in china on the right and then we have a port where the uh, the api is shipped to so we have an api supplier here in china shipping to shanghai port and from there to Europe, to Amsterdam. And there from Amsterdam port, um, it goes to a production facility producing bulk and also packaging the final um, product here in Northern Germany. And then to a distribution center here, the icon in red in Cologne. That's where I live, so I like to put the put the locations uh, of places where I know and from there of course um, we deliver some customers some end customers and I've just put here nine different 
um, countries with the capitals to indicate some customer demand. So we are interested in how we can serve the end customer demand ranging here from our API supply in China to the um, distribution in Europe and the end customer demand serving the European market. I excluded any additional randomness from the model to focus on the COVID-19 disruption so that without the disruption, we are on the mentioned happy path. So in our base case, I show you the results of the base case. It looks really nice. You see here on the bottom an inventory chart with a typical shape and no stock out whatsoever. Perfect service level of 100%. The happy path. But of course, we know that's not the case. So let's run the simulation now, do a simulation experiment, and see what happens when we've got a supply disruption because of COVID-19, meaning in this model that the port in Shanghai will be closed. So you now see the evolution here of this supply network in real time. Here in the top left of the map, you see the date and time. I put some charts here below. Um, you do not have to focus on the profit, et cetera, but we are focusing now on the inventory and on the service level. So right now, everything looks fine. But in, um, on the 11th of February, the port should close and then rope, reopen roughly two months later. So we are now in the middle of February. Port is already closed, indicated here by the gray icon, and we cannot receive any more shipments to Europe. So what we see now, the risk realized has realized, and now the effect of the risk will slowly dissipate through the supply chain. So we first will have a reduction here of stock at our, at our factory, then the stock of the finished good should decline. And um, then finally, we will fa face severe stock out situation. So you see now we are leaving the nice shape here on the bottom and our service level should soon begin to fall. Now you see the first drop and um, I will increase the speed a little bit because yeah, we have a long disruption of two months port closure. And now the port is back up, it's back online, but uh, the, the damage is already done. We went down to an almost 40% service level and it continues to go down even though the port is reopened again. And so in this simple supply chain, we see because, uh, because of the lead time and everything, we see some delayed effects here. And now finally, the service level, the average service level begins to increase again. So I will now finish the simulation. We are currently in the recovery process and the year is complete and we uh, it results in around about 70% service level over the whole year. So now we've got a pretty good estimate of what would have happened given the inventory policy and the, uh, the safety stock I used in that model. So, um, however, this is just one possible, po possible outcome of the disruption, but the port closure could be shorter or longer. So let's do a risk analysis. So we go to another tab. And now um, I run the same simulation a hundred times while the port closure duration is random. So we see the outcome of the disruption uh, for a hundred different possible outcomes. And we focus here on, um, on the time to recover, which is a KPI measuring, um, measuring the time your supply chain needs to come back to a certain normal service level. And so the experiment here now is in progress, meaning it runs the 100 simulations. And 
Um, we'll, we'll focus here on this chart in the bottom right, where I'm indicating the histogram of the outcomes. And yeah, we can, we can see um, now in this histogram, saving, it's saving the results. And now we should have the final chart. And we see that um, there's actually a huge range of possible outcomes, ranging from an almost instant recovery up to 110 days. And we see here the maximum um, amount of, of scenarios in the 70 days area. And so, um, so you get uh, the impression, what, what, is a, what is the worst case, what is the best case, etc. So this is an example how we can easily stress test your supply chain, not only with COVID induced disruptions, but theoretically with every thinkable disruption. So next, we could think of risk mitigation strategies such as second sourcing, model them in the software, and finally test them to evaluate the benefits of the respective mitigation strategies. I guess you agree that simulation, uh, supply chain simulation is a great tool to do risk analysis and management for almost every global acting company, but there's also a lot of recent research out there revealing general insights. For example, publications show that there's in fact a complex recovery process. So you first have to think about your contingency policy, then there has to be a revival policy, and then a switch back to a normal policy. And this fits really well with what we heard from Patrick, showing the challenges of a successful recovery process. And also another insight from a really recent uh, paper published just two weeks ago is that the actual timing and closing of uh, the timing of the closing and opening of facilities at different echelons um, is even more important than uh, the disruption duration and the propagation, propagation speed of the virus. So as I told you, I'm in the lucky position to teach and to research on that topic. And it is a, as it is a very practice oriented field, I always like to get into touch with industry experts such as today um, and also look into their problems, perhaps even start a mutual research project. So with, with that, I'd like to close and uh, look forward to your questions. Also feel free to contact me via mail, etc if you have any questions that we cannot answer right now. And so thank you for your attention and now handing over back to Patrick. What a perfect handover. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> Directly leading into um, our last um, topic for today, question and answers. I just screened there were ended a lot of a lot of questions so let me just pick two of them maybe for the remaining three minutes uh, first one is for you i think robert um, there was one question how long does it take in average to run a supply chain simulation project in a medium complex um, life science company uh, thanks for the question this is actually a really good question because uh, there's no definitive answer to that. Um, it depends, of course, and um, it's possible to do a really quick mock-up, a quick simulation, rough simulation within two days. But as all, I've also done uh, projects with 40, 50 days where you can really go into detail, run lots of different scenarios. So it really depends on what you want to achieve, how detailed you want to look into your supply chain. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Um, just checked another one. How do you see the future role of supply chain management as a function? Maybe that's a good one for you, Frank. You want to respond to this? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, sure. And and thanks. Um, we we see that more as as supply chain is becoming really um, into an absolutely leading function in in an organization in a very integrated way, going going forward. I mean, COVID-19 has just accelerated that um, that supply chain, and we have seen that trend over the last couple of years already. Is moving from, um, you know, the, the the back door to uh, the the front door, and and being really seen as um, a reliable 
very, very important uh, business partner. And we see that role just increasing. Um, now and in, in future, you, you mentioned that SNP is being part of uh, anybody for a while. We see um, sales and operation planning, integrated business management uh, planning is, is the main business management process. Um, we uh, see also the role of supply chain leaders um, being focusing on that. Um, we see similar similar relations like Robert uh, shown us right now, even incorporating leading um, indicator forecasting, which means being more proactively looking into the future in a very dynamic way. So supply chain is, is really going on to the forefront, um, being uh, so so important for, for companies going forward that you know, companies can't, uh, without having good functional supply chains leaders um, and having a very well run supply chain. Thanks, Frank. Nothing to add, I can confirm as well. Uh, so based on the conversations I had with many pharmacos the last four weeks, um, they said they're in a more comfortable role given the crisis situation, but um, they they are recognized as real um, yeah power um, to orchestrate um, the end, the end, not only supply chains but all the the whole enterprise. So I have to to admit yeah. Okay. Um, let me come to the last um, to the last slide. So uh, first of all, thanks for all of you participating this this webinar, a global webinar um, on life science and the topic of supply chain resilience, business continuity in the crisis of uh, of COVID nineteen. Um, thanks to Robert and Frank for your very comprehensive uh, presentations. And um, feel to all of you, feel free to to uh, reach out to the speakers. You see the um, the contact information on that slide. Um, as I said, we will distribute the recording and also the, all the the slides we the three of us presented today. So uh, that's why thank you to all of you participating. And um, I have only one thing to mention. So stay tuned for the next webinar, will take place very soon in May. Um, will be around uh, the dependency of global pharma supply on Chinese and Indian API, API supply. So that will be, is the working title and stay tuned, will be launched very soon. Um, so thanks to all of you and stay healthy. Bye bye.